So hear me out. Calculus is a stupid name. When you look into it, the name itself does nothing to describe what actually happens in calculus. Newton was hailed as a scientific hero, a genius, for his invention of calculus and the connection he made with classical physics. Right here, he introduced a method through which we could model physical reality, given that we had enough information. This was in 1665, while Newton was in lockdown to escape the bubonic plague. You know, when we were in lockdown, we just watched Queen's Gambit or The Tiger King, or we started uh, making YouTube videos. And Newton? He decided he'd just go and unlock the laws of the universe. The motion of the planets and why they were ellipses was no longer a mystery. It was a natural consequence of the constant pull of gravity by the sun. And somehow an apple hit his head or something and gave him the idea to invent a whole new mathematics called the method of fluxions. Wait, 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 wait. That's, that's not calculus. Newton invented calculus, right? Why? would he call it something so silly? Okay, let's step back. What is the word calculus? Why do we call what we teach in school the calculus? Why don't we ever call it fluxions or, or whatever? When did that change even happen? So if you look up the etymology of calculus, we get a really close sounding word. Uh, okay, uh, we get the same exact word, calculus. This used to mean a small rock or a pebble, and we still use it that way today. Uh, kidney stones? A biliary calculi. And you thought learning calculus was painful. Passing calculus takes a whole new meaning here. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I thought that was hilarious when I was working on the script late at night. Uh, my wife actually made that joke. How do we get from stones like gall or kidney stones to, to calculus? And what does that have to do with the invention of this neat little thing called an abacus? What we see as a children's toy nowadays was essential for doing any sort of arithmetical calculations. We don't know the exact time it was invented, but probably between 300 and 500 BC in Babylon. And that's the same place that gave us this horrible system of 60 that persists in our timekeeping. So where does the word calculus come in here? It's, it's right there. That little pebble, it's a rock. It's calculus. This shows how the word calculus got all tied up in calculation. Uh, did you hear that? Calculation? Yeah, we, we talk about rocks all the time and don't even realize it. We're just like a step beyond cavemen. In this spirit, if we let Google autocomplete this phrase, the calculus of, I assure you, no one is taking derivatives for any of those. It means the calculation of or the logic of something. Okay, now we understand how we got calculus as in calculate from calculus as in the rock. That's because of these little beads or pebbles on our 2,500 year old calculator from the people that gave us annoying clocks. How do we get the calculus? Let's look at fluxions for a minute. This is what Newton called derivatives in his methods of fluxions. Essentially, he thought of fluxions and fluents as describing flowing quantities, sort of like continuous or smooth functions today. Back then, the notions of continuity were still very much in their infancy. When Newton communicated his idea to Leibniz, he wrote, I cannot proceed with the explanations of fluxions now. I prefer to conceal it as thus. And he gave this weird alphanumeric code. He literally made a hash code to keep other people from figuring it out. Essentially, he expressed fluxions in what we would call an infinitesimal form. Uh, for the quadratic function, you get something like this, if you look at it, small change of O from T. You get this dangling O squared, and as O gets really, really small, that term vanishes faster than this term here, so he claimed you could ignore it. George Berkeley, nearly 70 years after the invention of calculus, describes the discomfort felt by some just ignoring these terms in his treatise, The Analyst, where he says, and what are these fluxions? The velocities of evanescent increments? And what are these same evanescent increments? They are neither finite quantities nor quantities infinitely small, nor yet nothing. May we not call them the ghosts? of departed quantities. Back then, calculus wasn't on the solid theoretical grounds that it is on today. Berkeley saw the foundations of calculus as just another religion for mathematicians, and some called this the metaphysics of calculus. It would be over 100 years before mathematicians started to hit on the right ideas for a foundation of calculus, and we call that foundation analysis. Wait, analysis is just like the title of the treatise, The Analyst. It turns out this whole subject encompassing calculus was called analysis by Newton himself. But that's still not calculus. If you 
told your mother you went to high school and learned analysis, your mother would ask you what you were analyzing. I uh, nothing. This is another unfortunate choice of name for the subject. So if Newton was calling the subject analysis, who could have started calling it calculus? It must have been someone really important, right? It was Leibniz. Leibniz did it. And you can see in the titles of his manuscripts, Methodi Tangentium Directi Compendium Calculi and Calculus Tangentium Differentialis. 10 points to Gryffindor. Everything was written in Latin back then. And the first one translates to Compendium of the Calculus of the Direct Method of Tangents and the second to Differential Calculus of Tangents. I'll put a link to a nice stack exchange discussion in the description as well as a link to the collection of Leibniz's work, which is public domain at this point. Leibniz's take on calculus was a bit of a different but roughly equivalent method to uh, Newton's. It also came out a bit later than Newton's functions and Newton claimed that Leibniz actually stole his ideas. This is a huge topic that deserves its own video, but it came down to Newton forming a committee of the Royal Society to declare Newton as a rightful inventor of calculus. I, I, I mean analysis or reflections or whatever. Uh, oh, and he was also the president of the Royal Society at the time, so I'm sure this was all perfectly fair and above board. So we have a mainland European, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, a German mathematician calling fluxions differential calculus, despite these being invented by the winner of Britain's scientific popularity contest, Sir Isaac Newton. You can imagine uh, calculus wasn't a common usage in English scientific circles for a while. In fact, England closed itself off from the rest of Europe scientifically until roughly the early 1900s, where we start seeing English mathematics again flourish with Hardy and Littlewood. As for the addition of the in the calculus, that comes down to the utility that came with the invention of the calculus. All sorts of mysteries were left hanging over centuries and millennia. They were suddenly resolved by this new way of thinking. Zeno's paradox, where he was concerned with being able to travel any distance because you'd have to first do an infinite number of halves, that's just an infinite series that sums to one. The quadrature or area between a hyperbola and a line, this question that baffled the ancient Greeks is resolved by integral calculus. Kepler discovered the laws of planetary motion where a planet travels in an ellipse and sweeps an equal area in equal time, turns out to be a consequence of calculus. Seemingly everything that puzzled people for millennia were suddenly answerable and sometimes even to a high school student. So yes, the calculus, that much is very much appropriate. The calculus part, that's because we liked counting with rocks and I guess that's fine. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please, if you've liked it, you know, like and subscribe, you know, all that good stuff. It has been an absolute pleasure making this for you and I hope you have a great day.